Greetings everyone and welcome back to 365 Days of Prague. Today we're going to be reviewing the album Peter Gabriel 1 by Peter Gabriel. Hi, my name's Naomi. I'm an avid progressive rock fan, but I'm a long ways from knowing all the Prague albums out there. But this year, I'm going to give it a try. This is 365 Days of Prague. So this video is actually being recorded while I am live streaming. We currently have a few viewers in the chat and they're watching this video before it's even released. And well, this is something cool that I'm doing. I just wanted to let you all know how it looks to create a video and what are the behind the scenes. And well, this is what I'm doing. And if you want to see the entire creation of this video unfold, you can always check out my latest live stream, which will be definitely very cool. But for now, here are some of my favorite bits for from this album. Let's get right into it. So in the year of 1974, Genesis releases its seminal album called The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. And well, as expected, the band goes on tour with the album the following year. And while all might seem to be going quite fine for them, behind the scenes something bigger is unfolding. So in the process of creating The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, Peter Gabriel started distancing himself from the rest of the band. He would insist on sitting in a separate room and writing the lyrics while the band themselves worked on the instrumentation for the album. Of course, for context, in the time he was about to become a father and the realization of the struggles and the realization of commitments that he would have to take further on in his life started dawning on him and he started to get serious, if you will. But the essence of it was that the relationship that there was between Peter Gabriel and the rest of the band could not continue onwards like this. And well, when in 1975, Genesis started touring The Lamb, they already knew that at the end of the tour, Gabriel was gonna leave the band. And so, as expected, Gabriel left the band in 1975, and Genesis were generally expected to crumble now that they didn't have their leader. But of course they would prove everyone wrong when in 1976 they would release yet another seminal album, this one being a trick of the tale. And meanwhile, Gabriel, who was now a fresh father, still had a very strong appeal to music creation, but he wanted to take some time off to focus more on his family. But the will of creation was strong, and the endless possibilities of what he can do with a solo career was just a lot for him. So in 1976, Gabriel compiled a demo tape of ideas that he had floating around in his head, and rest assured that autumn the same year, he walked into the studio to start working on his debut solo album. And when the members of Genesis heard of the matter, they of course sent him a letter of good luck, thus cementing their good relations even after their breakup. Now consider this, it is 1976 and the golden days of Prague are not yet quite over but it's definitely starting to see a decline. But a decline is also a different way of saying it's starting to see yet a new progression into something even more new and exciting. And well, the world of music knew so and a lot of artists started experimenting with new types of sound and Peter Gabriel was definitely one of those people trying to reinvent the sound of Prague into something new that he much more wanted to create. And in order to achieve this self-expressive task, he would of course have to find just the right producer for the job. So at first he actually considered Zach Nietzsche, which worked with the Rolling Stones as well as Neil Young and even produced some various film scores. And yet another candidate for the role was actually no other than recently reviewed on this channel, Todd Rundgren. But Gabriel would ultimately actually choose Bob Ezrin, who produced for Alice Cooper, Kiss, and Lou Reed. 
Indeed, seeing as the two of them had a pretty shared mindset in the direction that this album was going for. And then the two started working on creating this album and quite quickly the first issue arose. You see, Peter Gabriel is a capable musician but honestly he did not know if he could perform all the parts in the way that he wanted them to. So he let Ezrin take on the responsibility of finding several contributing players that would fill in the roles and play certain instruments on here. Now some noteworthy picks that he had mainly from the world of prog are of course Robert Fripp on the various guitars and Tony Levin on the bass but not only, he also plays here the tuba and he's even the leader of a barbershop quartet. But there arises a question. Will this album even be progressive rock, a genre that by this point has been pretty well substantiated in the world of music? And well, the short answer would have to be no. And maybe at the time this was some sort of a progression upon progressive rock, but today we might even call this type of music more crossover prog. And of course crossover prog means that his music with progressive tendencies that sort of crosses the bridge over to contemporary music. And as far as I know, Peter Gabriel has always been a man of progress himself, trying to rediscover and redefine the realms of music. And well, that might also explain some of the reason why he chose to leave Genesis in the first place, seeing as these guys were basically content with moving on in the same exact direction while he probably had other ideas in mind, which is also what kind of led him to create The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. Now in that case, why is this album even on the list? Why did I put it on here if it's not really prog? Well, the short answer again would have to be curiosity. Yes, of course, I know that if I wanted to choose the most progressive album or maybe even the most progressively appealing album out of Peter Gabriel's discography, I probably would have had to go with this third one being Melt if I'm not mistaken. But you see, I was really interested to get to know what was the immediate musical direction that Gabriel took right after leaving Genesis, so I decided myself to put this album on the list, seeing as no one really recommended it, but I just really wanted to get to know what it sounded like. Now do note that I refer to this album as Peter Gabriel 1, but I am well aware that it also has the other name of Carr. Now in actuality, this album, much like the rest of the three to come after it, is an untitled album. There is no name for it, you may call it 1, you may call it Peter Gabriel 1, or Carr, it doesn't really matter all that much. And when it comes to the musical direction on this one, it seems like Gabriel has achieved his goal of progressing onwards with this new type of music, and while many people would consider this album to be quite a banger, I do find that a lot of prog heads kind of deter from this one. So this album starts out pretty badly if you ask me. Yes, it starts off with a song called Moibund, the Bürgermeister, and well, this one might be a good song in its essence, but the oscillating vocals that Gabriel has throughout the verses are just stuff that I cannot listen to. I don't like this. I actually lower down the volume, which is something that I often don't do because I want to listen to the album with all its grandeur, but this one just kind of burned through my eardrums, so I really wasn't enjoying this one at all. But luckily, after this opener, we'll move on to something more pleasant, at least in my opinion, and that's of course the well-known track of Salisbury Hill. This one is probably one of the more famous songs in the world, which has the 7-8 time signature, and honestly, I like this one, but I also think that it's quite over-popularized at times. Like, yeah, I get that it's a good song, but honestly, it is pretty monotonous to me in a way that I don't enjoy particularly, and that's of course just me talking with my extensive love for Prague and how much this one differs from what I personally enjoy. Actually, my favorite track on this album is the third song, the one to come after right after Salisbury Hill, and that's the song called Modern Love. Now, yes, I know, I have my hands up, it is not Prague. I know that it's not, but it's a really fun song with some really funky textures into it and I overall really like the sounds of it, especially the inclusion, the very unique inclusion of course, of the Fender Rhodes. But from this point onwards, I feel like this album goes a bit downhill and it's mostly just a snooze fest that I would have gladly skipped if I weren't committed to listening to the entire albums on this list. And of course, that's an absurd thing to say, seeing as it has Tony Levine on the tuba playing 
playing in it. But seeing as this video is actually being created while I am live streaming this as well, throughout the entirety of this video, I have been reading the comments from the chat and I've heard the opinions of several other people and what they had to say about this album. And I think we have sort of a consensus on here that this is not a shining masterpiece, but it's definitely a good album, at least when considered not in the realm of progressive rock. Some favorites of others from this album have to be La Dolce Vita and The Great Flood, which are definitely interesting tracks that I would like to listen to, but maybe not in the context of this series. But overall, I am very, very happy to have listened to this one, and I wanted to be off the hook really getting to know what Peter Gabriel sounds like, at least in his solo career, and now I know. And while I did not like this album that much, I will definitely be revisiting his discography, seeing as there is much potential, at least as shown by several other people who enjoy his type of music. So this album cover was of course made by the talented people over on Studio Hypnosis and of course especially by Storm Ferguson himself. And in the picture of this cover we can actually see Peter Gabriel sitting in a 1974 Lancia Flavia owned by Ferguson himself. And in this photo shoot they actually just sprayed the car with a bunch of water making it look like some sort of rain and then they took the picture in black and white film which was later developed and colored by hand with the iconic blue. Though in actuality the original idea for this album cover was to have Peter Gabriel have contact lenses that made his eyes look like metal balls. And while this idea was nice it did not make it on the front cover but you can actually find it in the inner sleeve of this album's gatefold. And you know, putting this album cover through the test of whether it does speak for itself and whether does it represent the songs to be found on here, I do believe that it does a pretty good job. This is a pretty scattered album all throughout, with a lot of themes put into it, but when I listen to songs on this album, I do envision the cover of this one, which shows a pretty interesting connection between the two. So all in all, I would call this album a bearable album, and at certain points it was even a bit fun, and for it it's gonna get a rating of 6 out of 10. But that's about it guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video and stay tuned for tomorrow because we're gonna be listening to Birds of Fire by Mahavishnu Orchestra. I of course want to thank my lovely supporters over on Patreon, so thank you so much to K1, Rist of Kings, and Lindsay Haycox, you guys are the best, and of course I want to thank to my lovely live stream viewers that have been with me and see we do all of these outtakes and shenanigans while creating this video, so thank you so, so much. But that's about it guys, have a wonderful day and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Bye guys.